Okay, good morning, ladies. I have extra minutes on the clock, and I am tempted to use them all. But I have been warned not to. Um, I'm so glad that you're here, that you stayed through the nine weeks of navigation, that you, your heads are still above water, um, especially since I know that the last two lessons have been more challenging. And I don't mean just about how much time they took, but how close they got to home. So before we began this whole process, I asked you to evaluate what you wanted to get out of it. Did you want to improve relationship making, improve relationship you were in, or figure out how to make some corrections in a relationship that might not be going so well? And we are on the course correction um, chapter now. And this is the, the, the the chapter that deals with when we have to make some changes. And as we began this, you'll remember that we all agreed that the only person that we could have any impact on changing is ourselves. And so I'm going to start us in a prayer this morning, and so we remember who's really in charge of even ourselves. Dear Jesus, you have sought us out as friends, and we are undeserving, but so grateful. And this is a season of gratitude, Lord. So remind us that the thing that we have the mo to be the most thankful for is that the things of this earth and the strife of this earth is not our everlasting home, that you have already gone ahead and prepared a place for us, which is a mansion and streets of gold, and everything works out between everybody because you are the light. Lord, we ask you to be the light into our path, the lamp into our feet as we delve into your word this morning. And it's to your glory that I bring it. And in your name's sake, amen. So um, I appreciate that you're here. I had the privilege last week of going to a conference about brains, about how the brain works. And when it comes to making friendships work or any other relationship works, it turns out that it's all in your head. And when it comes to learning and memory and pathways and things that we always do, there is a biological response to things that we have done and continue to do. It's called myelination. And that is the um, impulses and the connections we make in our brain become entrenched with biological material that has us going on the pathway that we most commonly have gone on over and over again. It's our default pathways. So when we have especially impacting things, it makes those pathways go from a dirt path, like I've done that once before and I kind of remember, to that's what always happens. That's my always and never pathway. It's like a super highway for our responses. And I think last week, in my small group at least, some of us said, this chapter makes me feel icky. I don't like what this is showing me. It, maybe it's showing me how I still harbor some issues with a high school problem, or how I have influenced my middle school daughter in a certain way because I haven't gotten over some things. Or maybe the way my mom did that took me off course, and now I always, because she always. These are the things that um, uh, hang us up. These are the things that we've probably been practicing in our minds sometimes our entire lives and we don't even know that we've created a super highway of responses to others that need to be changed. But the good news is they can be changed because we have a redeeming God who's in the, pro who's in the business of transformation. And there's some brain science to prove that as well. Um, the ancients in the Bible will often uh, translate the idea of brain or these pathways or these set responses as heart. And actually, in um, Hebrew, it's more about the gut or the intestines. They would say, the, my heart says or my gut says. And we translate it more modernly as, in my mind, I think this way. And we know that biologically it's happening in our mind. But tell me you haven't felt it in your gut. Tell me you haven't felt a blow to your gut or an implosion of your heart, and it sets itself up in your mind. In fact, those things that have the most emotional impact are the most likely to create superhighway pathways in your mind. And yet, we have a chance to correct all that. Take piano lessons, everybody? Music lessons? What's the word you always heard? Practice. 
right? What makes it practice? What what makes you good at anything is practice. Um, there's a book uh, by Malcolm uh, Gladwell, which I enjoyed several years ago, called Outliers, and it talks about what makes a person supremely good at their craft. And he uh, studies various um, aspects of people who have become excellent, most excellent at their craft. And he says he started with one um, study. His book opens with a study of violin players in Germany, who all began to take violin lessons at uh, about age eight. And um, as they progressed, by, by, by three years later or so, their practice schedule started to vary. Now these children were all graphed and categorized and they could see who had natural talent and who didn't and so forth, but they were all in one pool and they stayed about the same regardless of how much uh, practice they were doing till about for about three years. And after three years, the practice paths took two different routes. One increased and one decreased. Needless to say, the people that increased their practice became supremely good at their craft. And by age 20, there was a marked difference, even though they were all still playing the violin. His theory is that it takes 10,000 hours of practice to make you excellent at your craft. And my theory is I will probably never play the violin very well. Um, but um, we do know that from other science that it takes um, about 60 to 90 days to change a habit. Even if we don't become excellent at it, even to change it takes 60 to 90 days. And I don't mean 60 to 90 days only on Monday, Thursday, and Wednesday when you're up for it. I mean Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday for 60 to 90 days, uninterrupted practice at the very same thing before your habit makes a new superhighway in your head, which explains why a resolution made on January 1st and not fulfilled by February 1st never sees March 1st, correct? Three months later, if we haven't practiced everything we said we were going to do every day, perhaps up to 10,000 hours, it doesn't get settled in there and we go back to our default pathways. My job here this semester is not to make you practice friendship more or to focus on what you can do more. It's to focus on who already did it more. And we're going to spend some time in the book of Philippians. And um, you can open your books, your Bibles to the book of Philippians. And I'll say a word about that. We have done most of our studying and all of your research in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because I wanted you to hear out of the mouths of, of those who were with Jesus at the time of his life and very shortly around that time, what he said about how to do people. I wanted you to hear it straight from him. The books following Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the epistles, are letters that the leaders of the church, Peter included, and Paul, have been writing to the communities that have developed a love for Christ and an attempt at a love for one another and they need instruction. These are instructive letters in how to do people, how to do church, how to be a disciple, how to make it manifest, how to make it attractive, and how to market it to others. And so they're instructive letters to us as well. We settled ourselves in, in Jesus' words, and we're gonna finish out with words to people just like us. These are the words that leaders would tell us to do. And here's from, from um, our brother Paul, who, if you know his story at all, is the ultimate example of someone who changed his pathways, his mental pathways. He went from a killer and a hater to a lover and a saver for the sake of Christ. He's our best model. He begins like this, final chapter. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Everybody say it. Think about such things. And here's the response. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into, everybody say it, practice. And the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. Peace is something that happens between people, among people. And this is what we want to, we have peace with God, and we have peace with one another when we do whatever is admirable, pure, lovely, etc. These are the attributes of Christ himself. 
And so the more we concentrate on him, we figure out what Jesus would do, the more that we know what we would do. And I know that this takes a lot of practice, and I'll tell you why I know it for sure, because this week I blew it, and I wrote this stuff. I wrote this stuff, I researched this stuff, I've taught this stuff, I've retaught this stuff, I've framed it, I've reframed it, and this week I, I did a bonehead thing. And I just am telling you, this is a life's work of applying your life to Jesus' life and making a comparison and deciding that he must have it right and I must have to make some corrections. And, um, and if you don't believe Jesus, you might believe this guy. <sighs> Dr. Phil, he's very famous for saying, how is that working for you? That thing that you do over and over again and expect a different response, Einstein calls insanity. Um, so we are going to talk about how it's working for us to go ahead and take that same old stance we had and what options we have might for taking another stance. So we've done the habits that, can, that expect. These are, there you are, habits, things that say, I appreciate that you're here in my presence. We have discussed the habits that connect, the things that we actually have to do, the action words that draw us into the life of another. And now we're on the habits that correct, which are reflect, reflect, <laughs> There we go. We can't quite do this, Cheryl, can we? Reflect, refine, and re reframe. We'll just stick with this section. In this section, we're going to try to see what's true about ourselves and our relationships, what is ours to change, to do or stop doing, and what friendships might need to just plain stop. So habits that correct begin with the most important one, reflecting. An effective friend checks her motives and methods. James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, and if you'll remember at some point in our study, Jesus said, who is my family? My family is who follows the Lord who's following me. And James has come around, and he is following Christ, and he's got a book in the Bible, and James is a great one to say, he gives us a lot of corrective action in here. He's saying to us right here, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Your desire, you desire but do not have, so you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask, and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend what you get on your pleasures." If you didn't have the highlights in there, might you know what the point is? Who is the point? Who is on the other end of this finger? That's you, me and you. And James says, we start with wrong motives. We want what we want for ourselves. This is a very natural thing. I want you to meet a couple friends from Scripture. Turn to Philippians 4, if you will. These are two gals whose names haven't become awfully popular, Iodia and Syntyche. In Philippians 4, we meet them doing almost exactly what James just said, but we're not exactly sure what's going on. Philippians 4, 2 says, I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, Help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Here's Paul, a transformed follower of Christ, influencing the entire uh, region, particularly the Greeks, pleading that a couple of women get along. Why does it matter? Why did it make history? that Iodia and Syntyk weren't getting along. And I'll say, we don't have far to look this past week or so to see how divided, how divisions in the church look from the outside. They had work to do at the beginning of the church, and we have work to do now to demonstrate that our love for one another, which is the same love, in Jesus himself, is a love that surpasses and supplants differences. Differences in applications, differences in how we vote, differences in how we speak. 
Yodi and Sintik had a division, and the loyal yoke fellow were called upon to help them get it right. Hi, loyal yoke fellow. Welcome to relationships. Welcome to Relationships 2016, when the world is looking at Jesus' followers and wondering, what are you people about? And what we need to stop doing, and what we need to start doing, is what we want the world to see. So I can give you habits, I can give you ways of talking, I can give you scripts for your Facebook posts, but what really matters is that we continue to call upon our ultimate Lord and Savior Jesus, and help him guide us in our differences, which we will have, which they did have. I've been married for 32 years. I haven't got that right yet. I haven't got the friendship thing right yet, but I love, this is a, a signature verse for me in Philippians 3, 3.12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, Brothers, or I say sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only live, let us live up to what we have already obtained. Jesus is calling us to something higher than whatever is dividing us. We can take this back to our principles. We can take this back to our how, how, how much we're stopping, how often we're prioritizing another, how well we're looking into people's lives and their eyes, how hopeful we're being, how often or how um, sincerely, we're extending ourselves. How carefully we're listening. Yes. I just read Philippians 3, 12 through 15. My favorite verses. Thank you for asking. And we can um, practice being more careful about repeating the names we've learned this morning. May I say some names I've learned this morning? Karen and Amy. Practicing the names of people that mean uh, important things to us by giving them things that meet, meet them in their uniqueness. But those are just the tip of the iceberg. Those are just things we do. What really matters is how we do them and why we do them. Next, we're going to move on to the habit of refinement. An effective friend makes changes by choice. James has a word to say about that. James 4, submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Did I tell you James had a word about our behavior? Can you hear him? If you met him, would you recognize him, maybe? He'd be the one like your um, taskmaster at school that made you a better student, but you didn't really like it that much. <laughs> Here's James giving us a list of things to do. Now, we can keep all of this in our mind. We did nine weeks, a couple of hours a week, uh, an hour on Tuesday. Uh, we sat at the table and we shared ideas, but unless we take that food and go exercise it, um, it's going to die away like a weak pathway, and we're going to go back to our default mechanisms. So the reason I gave you seven steps or such is so that you could remember, because I need to remember what is it I'm supposed to do and why. And James gives us another list of action words. He says, submit to God. Number one, we remember who's in charge and who isn't. Number two, resist the devil. It's, it's a real thing that there is spiritual warfare going on right now. And resisting that has a lot to do with fortifying yourself. 
Come near to God. Come near in the Word. Come near in Bible study. Come near in community. Wash yourself. In other words, quit doing the things that are making you dirty. Purify yourself for something better. Grieve the change. There's never been a change in pattern in a person's life, whether it's for good or for bad, that hasn't caused a, a, some kind of a rift in your heart, whether it's just a pattern. People who say they gave up smoking and wanted to still miss the respite that smoking gave them. If you have to leave something behind and you know it's bad for you, you still might have to take time to grieve the loss of that pattern of behavior. Change what you're doing and most importantly, beginning and ending in the same space, humility, humility before God. So all the behaviors have to be packed into the fact that we understand God's in control and I'm not. Humbling ourselves and submitting ourselves to that authority. Now here's God's response from James 4. Yeehaw, there's good news. He's going to come near and he will lift me up. I won't long for that old way when there's something so new and something good next to me. God is a God who is faithful to his promises. Now, here's something. These are hard words. Sometimes they're harder for some of us in some relationships than others of us. One thing I know is when you tell a two-year-old who just hit his sister to say, I'm sorry, it's not that sincere. But we can train him to say, I'm sorry. When they get to be about three or four, they can say it, and they can say it like they don't mean it. Sorry. Fourteen, I've heard that as well. Sorry. So we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be truly repentant and truly sorry, because there are, because there's nobody else we're, we're apt to, uh, aiming to change in this study, we're aiming to change ourselves, we certainly have something that we need to say we're sorry about. So here we go. The Five Languages of Apology is a book by Gary Chapman. He's the Five Languages of Love Languages guy is very famous. He actually co-wrote this book with a woman named Jennifer, whose name I failed to write down. Jennifer, you, you're owed the rights to this. I, I can't remember your last name. Five Languages of Apology. He said, I'm sorry I, which is I'm expressing regret. Now the key thing here is that third word, I, because no, no less sincere is sorry than I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you didn't like it, because that's not an apology, is it? Those are just words that fill in the blank. So that I is the key word here. I'm sorry, I. That takes uh, responsibility. I was wrong accepts responsibility. Specifically, there should be maybe an ellipsis after that. I was wrong when I. I was wrong when I raised my voice. I was wrong when you said that and I, the, I had the the day on my back, and I Im Im imploded on you because of something that happened earlier. I'm sorry I was wrong specifically. What can I do to make it right? This is offering restitution. I don't often say this, and I don't know if this is a, a, a language of apology my, my husband seems to need. I'm going to think about that. Sometimes I'm sorry I did it, and I'm sorry I did it specifically isn't quite enough. I need just somebody to say, this is how I'm going to make it up to you. I think that um, Jesus did a good job of, of giving Peter an offer of restitution. When Peter said, Ugh, I'm sorry I denied you three times, and he said, how can I make it up to you? And Jesus said, you know what, you can. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Gave him an offer of restitution. What can I do to make it right? I'll try not to do that again. Repenting. I'd like to say, I say I'll never do that again. But because I have those old pathways, those myelinated highways in my mind, the chances are I might go there again. I might take what my dad said and make it into what my husband didn't quite say. I might take what you said to me when I came in the room and, and push it back into high school. I might think that voice nagging in the back of my mind is my mother's when it really has nothing to do with my mother. So I might have to try to work at that again. Requesting forgiveness. Will you please forgive me? I love it when we teach our children to say these words. Will you please forgive me? This is actually what we have to say to Jesus, isn't it? This is what we say to Jesus in the form of confession. We say, Lord, I agree that I did this wrong. Will you please forgive me? 
And of course, Jesus answers yes. Here's a few quotes on apologies. Thomas Fuller says, you can't repent too soon because you don't know how soon it will be too late. Today could be the first day of the rest of our life or the last day of the first of our life. Paul Bozzi says, forgiveness did not change the past, but it does enlarge the future. A word on that. I'm talking about us asking for forgiveness. There are circumstances that are much heavier than the ones I'm touching on here, ones for which you are seeking somebody to ask you for forgiveness. And we can't control them. We can certainly pray for them. We can gather the, uh, the mercy and grace to do so. Um, there's more on apologies and forgiveness from the other side than I can handle in this scenario. But God has a few things to say about apologies and forgiveness that are even more pertinent than Gary Chapman and Jennifer, whatever her last name is. Um, he, has some, he has a good idea here. Good advice. Forgive as you want to be forgiven. This is a mental state. You know, want to be forgiven? You should forgive. This is a mental state. This is a retooling of your mind. Good. Good idea. Good advice. Better advice. Ah, when you're actually praying, if you hold anything against anyone, work on forgiving them so that your Father can forgive you. This is like, oh boy, okay, I'm being called upon while I'm in relationship with God to think about my relationship with others. And here's the best thing of all. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us, forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just do it, because he already did it. Like I said, this is a, this is a harder thing to do than I expect to uh, finish out here in the, in the last week of our study. But I do know that, that Jesus gives us everything we need to do, the hardest things of all. And, um, and I, I, I trust him for that, even though the, the process may be long. Last thing to do here, reframe. An effective friend sets healthy boundaries. The book Boundaries and its sequels are very helpful for those of us who sometimes get into a situation where we are um, so integrally related to somebody else's problem that we can't uh, see ourselves anymore. We can't breathe, we can't solve it, we're stuck. Um, so um, we do have some um, advice from Matthew 18 about how to solve disputes from among, uh, fr among believers. So those of us who say, Jesus, you are our ultimate boss, and we are in agreement together, we are children of the living God, and we've all stated that, we have, we have a different platform to uh, get over some things with. We agree. So the first thing that Matthew 18 tells us is to take the offense privately to the offender. Oh, that's so hard. Um, that's so hard. I mean, I have a job, I used to be a teacher, and um, if there was a parent that had an issue, they would often want to call, you know, the principal. <laughs> They'll call the principal, or they call you because they don't, you know, it's icky. Oh, hey, that thing you did yesterday really bugged me. We'd rather tell someone else. But if we are among the family of God, we have strict orders that this is between brother and sister sister and sister, and we are told to take the offense privately to the offender. And then we have to do that other hard thing, which is listen. Listen for their heart, listen for their repentance, listen for um, an agreement or a disagreement on that. Do I agree that this was an offense? Then we get to seek consultation and support from other believers. Now these are people we are mutually respectful of. So I don't get to call the guy on my side and you get to call the girl on your side. We have to say, who are our mutual friends? And say, this is an issue for us. This is hard to do. I can't say that I've really done this very well. This ends up looking like I talk to the other believers, but I leave out the person with whom I have a problem. That would be called gossip. And that is not what I'm talking about. And then Jesus tells us we have to listen and wait. And then we take it to the attention of a church authority as needed. And then we have to listen. What happens next? Is that person agreeing, repenting, changing, transforming? Am I agreeing, repenting, changing, transforming? But if none of that is happening, we do have the right to separate as necessary for our health and others' health. 
and um, that needs to be negotiated differently in different circumstances. Once again, I'm talking about friendship. This is not a covenantal relationship. This is not a familial relationship. This is not marriage. This is girlfriends. And so you may have to separate from people who are, let's call it toxic. That's a word that you hear out there, toxic relationships. Now, if you're among non-believers, it's a little bit different story. In fact, the bar is higher because you are a witness to the watching world. That's where we are right now. We are a witness to the watching world. So James tell, Romans tells us, this is Paul speaking to the people in Rome. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Here it comes. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it's mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. If it is possible, live at peace with everyone. Not always possible. But James tells us the watching world wants to know what it is we believe. And so, if we look just like the others, repaying evil for evil, if our behavior does not reflect the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, we won't send the right message about who he is, and others won't want to follow him. Matthew 5, 15 tells us to be salt and light. That means to flavor and preserve and enlighten people along the way. Be aware of our aroma. It says in 2 Corinthians. See, Paul is writing to the Corinthians from a person, from a place of knowing. Before he had an encounter with the living God and transforms his heart and mind and body and actions for all time, Christians made him sick. They smelled like death to him. And so death is what he gave them. 2 Corinthians said, we will be the scent of life or the stench of death, depending on where people are in their life. You have to expect that sometimes you're going to repel people with this beautiful thing. But that's not your job. God took care of Paul, and he will take care of them. So don't repay evil for evil. It is just true. We will not be appealing to everyone all the time at every season. I heard a lot of um, Christians talk before that smelled like life to me, before the scent and aroma of life became evident to me and desirable. So this is what we know so far. We were made in and for relationship. We learned that in the first chapter. God intended relationship to be the mechanism by which he communicated his love to us. It is how Jesus reaches us for God. It is the whole purpose that Jesus came to earth was to create a pathway to a relationship with God. He asked me to do what he does. And the more I focus on the best interest of others, the more like Jesus I am. Can't change anyone but myself. But friendship habits can be learned and practiced 10,000 times, 90 solid days, 70 times 7, whatever it takes. My friendship's mistakes can be confessed. They can be corrected. But God is the ultimate transformer. I don't even transform myself. If I want to submit myself and humble myself and put some action in between, I've got a pretty good Oreo cookie. God on both sides, my efforts in the middle. Now the question is, what do you know so far? The last one is a question mark. What do you know? What do you know now that you didn't know when you started? And what could you tell someone else? Or what do you need to practice some more? Or what do you wish you understood better? I want to hear from you. My, my email's at the, at the bottom of the page. This is an exercise for me. I assume it's an exercise for you. It's a discipline. Jesus called his people together, and he gave them instruction, and he gave them practice, and he called them disciples, and that's who we are. People who are taking his instruction and practicing what he tells us. And pretty soon we're going to be called upon to do that on behalf of somebody else. We teach them to do the same. We are women of influence because we are under the God of great influence. And so this is my prayer for you. I'm going to pray it over you, and then I'm going to ask you to turn to someone else that's on your sheet and pray it over them. Okay? These are the words from Paul, again, from Philippians. 
This is my prayer for you, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depths of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And all God's children said, Amen. So will you turn to someone now? And maybe this is where you do a little of that connecting, extending. And look at them. Get closer. Ladies, we're the family of God. We are the lovers of his soul. We are the beloved of his life. Take this risk and love each other now, and then take this risk and love someone else today. Okay, are you ready to repeat it together? Touch somebody. You can look at your page, but you've got you to gotta be connected. Look at your page while you read it. There's room. Y- y- all, y- all connected? Okay. All right, everybody. This is my prayer for you that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depths of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Go in peace.